You know, it's amazing to me. I, I know the grade tens and elevens. They've been doing stuff on the way, and uh, that's what we're going to carry on with with the grade twelve. We're going to be dealing with a really interesting topic. It's called diffraction. So I, I hope that you're in for it tonight, and that you you're excited about. Yes, I'm very excited. I really want to learn. Guys, please do remember that you can always find your friends to actually see in this class because this is a very important class in physical sciences as well. And if they're fans of the other ones, they're fans of the other ones. And if you need that, you can go in all four resources and stay free to use that. In any case, guys, please do like us on Facebook. Our Facebook page is that is where you can actually put all of your Facebook questions and comments. John and Studio will definitely answer them as well as possible. Thanks, Timmy. Great to be with you again this evening. And so let's get straight into it and uh, let's get going. The fraction uh, isn't just about, uh, it's about all waves. It's a special property of waves. And so we need to have a look at it, and let's have a look at the overview of what we're going to be doing tonight. So, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to start with just a little bit of a revision, because to understand the fraction, we need to introduce a new term. And this term is called a wave front. So we're going to define a wave front. We're going to show you how to represent it. Um, and it's really important that you get this right, because you might think that you understand everything there is to know about waves, the one thing that grade 12 you need to know about is wave fronts. Use wave fronts to explain and represent this property as well as interference, which we'll be covering next week. So let's move on now. So what we're going to do is going to demonstrate uh, diffraction of waves. We're going to show you examples of diffraction of waves in the real world, as well as some diagrams that you could get asked in, the, in your exams or textbooks. You might even have seen in your textbook. Explain those. We'll then also show the relationship between the slit width, the wavelength of a wave, and the amount of diffraction taking place. So we'll explain exactly what that means uh, and show you examples of where there's been lots of diffraction and where there's only been a little bit of diffraction. The next part is the theory part, which I've seen come up in past exams. You need to understand and be able to explain Huygens principle. Really strange name that Huygens principle H U Y G E N S. Uh, it, it was named after a Dutch physicist, and he did some constructions which we'll have a look at, and we'll try and use Huygens principle to um, explain the fraction in different examples. And then the last part is we might not get to all of this, um, but we'll prepare for next week as well. Is to have a look at the diffraction of light. Now, light is a wave, it has a wave nature, it also has a, a particle nature, but we're going to look at the wave nature of light to try and explain uh, what happens when light passes through a very small gap and see exactly what the pattern that happens. That's what we're looking at, single slip diffraction, look at the pattern and try and explain it. But where do we start? Let's start by reminding ourselves about waves. Now, when we think about waves, you could think about a whole lot of things. Probably the most common way would be a water wave. And now you can go and play uh, in the bath tonight, or run a basin, even just put a little bit of water in, a, in an ice cream container and dip your finger in, and you'll see that there are little ripples on the, on the surface. Uh, as those ripples spread across the surface, we recognize that movement of ripples across the surface is really a wave being produced. If you dip your finger in a number of times, uh, that pattern will continue to work. And you'll see that the waves will bounce off the surface of the bath or the, the, even of a little ice cream tub uh, or container. How we represented waves in earlier grades is to show them as a side view. So in water waves, we recognize we have something, and I just want to add some terminology here, we have something that's called a crest. That's the maximum displacement above the rest position. So the wave was smooth, the water was smooth and flat before the disturbance. 
We recognize some of the particles are moving up and so they form a crest, but other particles are moving down and they form a trough. We also recognize that the next set of particles that are moving up, they form a crest. And the distance between a crest, one crest and the other crest, that distance is known as one wavelength and we use the symbol lambda to represent it. But it's not just from one crest to another crest. We could have done it from top to top as well. Or in fact, the more accurate definition of a wavelength is to say any two particles that are uh, on consecutive paths, the successive paths of the wave that are in phase. So as this particle is moving up, the other particle is moving up in the same way. But notice, they're on different paths of the wave. There's one after the other. So uh, this particle over here is on the crest. If, next, if the wave was moving from left to right, this particle would start moving down. As would that particle start moving down? Um, because this, the wave is moving through the medium. Okay? There are successive points. Successive. They're one after each other. So if we're on the wave, on this one, uh, in this one dimension, this plane, we would say this point, the next one that's like it, it's further down the wave, it's on the next crest, it's successive, it's after. So it's successive. Okay? That gives us a wavelength. Two points that are successive on a wave that are in phase, that distance is the wavelength. Okay, hope you've got that. Now, guys, we don't just want to stop there. What we want to recognize in water waves is that we've taken a cut, we've taken a slice down the, wa the wave, and we're looking at it from the side. But this isn't a very accurate representation, because in fact, what I could do is I could, and I hope my, my uh, drawing now works, I could actually say, hold on, this isn't just one wave, but in fact, it's a whole lot of waves, and they're next to each other and I can pile them on next to each other like that and group them up so that you can see that there's not just at this point, there isn't just one crest, but next to this point, just a little bit further along to the left or to the right, there are a whole region of crests. All of these points are on the crest. And I've drawn a line to show those together. Let me just change the color. So that point is at a crest, that point is at a crest, that point. So if I'm looking from the side or from the top, I'm going to see a whole lot of crests next to each other. I hope you can understand that. That these points are not successive, but they are moving together in phase. Remember, in phase means they follow the same motion up and down. So they are not successive. These ones are called adjacent. They are next to. They are next to each other, so we say they are adjacent. Uh, and so what we're saying here, all of these points that are moving up and down in time with each other, in phase with each other, they make up an imaginary line. The imaginary line we call a wave front. So a wave front is an imaginary line joining all the points that stand next to each other and that are doing exactly the same thing. Now you can say to me, well, how can we see this? Well, what we've got to do is, this was a side view, but instead of taking a side view, let's take a top view. Now, I know that many of you um, would be eager for a holiday, and particularly a summer holiday, and maybe you would like to go to the beach. I was very fortunate. I grew up very close to the beachfront, and uh, what I did, um, and I hope you can see this, although it's a little bit blurry, uh, is I've taken a picture from Google Maps of the Durban beachfront, and I've put it onto the smart presentation, and I hope you can see, here's the beach, so this is the beach, and here are the white water waves that are coming in. And what I hope you can see is that, that even out far at sea, there are regions here that are following similar patterns. 
and they're not all together straight because the surface of the of the ocean underneath isn't exactly straight and smooth either. What we're seeing is regions where the particles are doing the same thing. They're either all going up or they're all going down. And what we call those particles, if we look at them from the top, as I've drawn the line through them as they appear the same, um, those things we call wave fronts. And it's really nice if you're on the beach to sit and watch the breakers rolling in. We call it, that we see them rolling in, rolling in. We're not talking about the ones that tumble in, in this lesson. We're talking the ones that are far out to sea. You can see the swell, the crest moving towards. If you go out on a pier like that structure out there, you can even on, on some of the piers in Durban, you can go very far out and you'll be able to see those swells moving in. We're going to have another picture of that a little later to explain another feature. But do yourself a favor. Get onto Google Maps, take the satellite view, and you'll be able to see those wave fronts as they move together. This is a very important concept. And I want you to get the idea that we're not looking from the side anymore. Even though these are transverse waves, ocean waves have a longitudinal section to them. We'll think about them as transverse. Um, but what we're saying is, here, these waves, we're looking from the top, they have a wave front. So our picture of the wave in grade 12 changes a little bit. And that's important for you to know. So, what we need to recognize is, let's draw a picture of it and, and, and diagram, um, put it into a diagram. So, first thing that I want to do is I'm going to say, let's say that this section here, the blue line, is a set of crests. So that's a crest. And all the points along here are crests of the waves that we're drawing together. This is a wave front. I'm now going to take this wave front and say, after a moment in time, what we'll see is this, this wave front, this crest, had moved into the medium. It will take a certain time to move that distance. And now we've got a, another crest, a certain distance away from it. That would be the wavelength. This one would replace it, and so we've got one wavelength between those two. One wavelength. That is lambda between those two. Notice in the space over here, we would have a trough. So we'd go crest, trough, crest. And then, if I really want to complete the diagram and show you what's happening, as we move through the medium, we would get another wave front. This wave front moves through the medium, and they're equally spaced, showing up the wavelength as it propagates through the medium. Now, I'm just drawing it, and, and so I'm not doing it very accurately. I should really be extending it from the end one, but uh, I hope you get the picture. So, what we've got here is a tank with wave front moving through the medium. We're recognizing the motion of the wave is from the left to the right. They're all one wavelength apart. And that's the key thing for you to understand about wave front. Hope you've got it. Make sure that you understand that we're looking at the top view. Don't understand that you're going to get confused when we look at this next property, very interesting property of wave, which we call diffraction. So what is diffraction? Well, let's go and find out. Okay. And here we go. Again, we're looking at water waves. And I've taken another satellite picture from Google Maps. And uh, uh, it's another part of the Durban beachfront, close to the entrance of the harbour. So this is where the harbour is. And this line over here is a reef. Uh, it's called, this is Vecchi Pier. And this is a little reef uh, where they do um, snorkeling and scuba diving and all that sort of thing. Now, what I want you to see, you can perhaps see it a little bit clearer on here, is that there are lines here that are going parallel to each other that are, are forming. I'm not drawing them all in. But I hope you can see that they're moving in uh, towards the, the beach front. They're moving in in that direction towards the beach front. But notice what happened around this point here and around this point here. We get behind this barrier some waves that are still going in. So the waves are coming here, and now suddenly they've changed direction. 
That's exactly what the Saxon is all about. It's a bending of ways. So they don't normally just carry on going straight, but they bend around obstacles. Isn't that cool? Waves don't always just go straight through a medium. We recognize that sometimes they do. When the medium is uh, transparent, then we can get light or a wave moving through the medium. Might change a bit of direction, but in this case, there's a changing and bending. Light waves and water waves can all bend. Okay, Trivi, you got a question on Facebook, or is there something that you want to say to me? Yeah, no, that, that's right. Remember now these terms. You've brought up a really good point, and it's important to mention that. That the term reflection, refraction, and diffraction are all different. And we need to understand the difference between those. So we're talking about diffraction which is the bending of light by, or bending of waves, and we're just talking about waves at the moment, general waves, water waves, and we're saying they bend. They bend behind the barrier. Let's just, uh, what we're going to do is I think that we can take a break at that point and uh, we'll come back and show this in a diagram and so that learners have got a clear idea. I want to pose a challenge. If that was the diagram that was given to you and this was a wave front, Okay? This is a barrier. What do you think is going to happen when that wave front reaches that barrier? What's going to happen on this side? What's going to happen over here? Guys, take the few minutes that we've got for an ad break and see if you can answer this. We'll be going to take an ad break now. Okay, let's take this way. Think about it to a bunch of us when we come back. Okay, that's a very good question. And what we need to, to do is to see the two examples. And, and the first one was one that I've just given you, uh, where we say there's a barrier and we're moving uh, wa waves, water, or even sound, and it moves towards a barrier. What we recognize is that the waves can bend around the barrier. There is a second condition that we can find, a second place that we can find, and that's where we've got two barriers. And those two barriers make a little gap. This little gap over here, okay, that little gap there, we call a slip. It's just a really a slip or a gap, and we get a very interesting pattern when we get this situation. So, thanks so much for that really great question. What we need to recognize is, we'll come to it just now, is what makes things diffract more and what makes them diffract less. And that's really important. So, I'm not going to jump into that, but the main times that you'll see diffraction are these two. When you've got a straight barrier and there's bending that's happening over here, and what happens when we have a slip or a gap and there will be bending of some sort. So those are the two conditions. Does that make sense to me? Yes, it does. Okay. Right. Do you think it's time that we fill this in? Oh, yes. Okay. L let's see exactly what, what happens over here. Guys, I hope you've had your pens up and you've been scribbling down on your sketch because let's think this through. I'm going to take this off. There's the barrier. There's the wave front. And I want to draw it in nicely for you. So what we recognize is after a certain time, this wave will have moved. Now I'm going to see if I can move uh, from here. This, there we go. 
and it will get to that position. Now, Trini, I want you to think about this now very carefully. If I go running to the wall, okay, a barrier, can I get, you think the water, this is a solid wall, and it's, a, it's fine, and the ripple is coming to the wall. Do you think it can get through the wall? No. What's going to happen when it touches the wall? Correct. Correct. Bounce back. Now, the correct word for bounce back in terms of physical science and wave is what? Let's make sure. This section is going to bounce back. That's what Tony has said. Bounce back. Now, I don't want you to write bounce back in your in your text. What you need to say is the correct word here is this section is going to undergo reflection. Okay. So what's going to happen is I'm going to now take this little bit of the way and I'm going to say, oh, oh, we're only interested in that bit. This bit is now going to start moving in that direction, like that. Okay? Watch. So it moves forward, it hits the barrier, it's going to bounce back. It's going to hit the barrier, it's going to bounce back. And that will carry on happening. Uh, it will hit that side of the tank and it will bounce back. And it will bounce back. And it will bounce back. And it's like a ping pong ball bouncing back across the ping pong table. Okay. But the interesting thing I'm going to suggest to you is what do you think happens over here? What is the natural prediction, do you think, is going to happen? The way it comes to the gap over here, predict for me what's going to happen as this object moves. So the, the wave, remember that's a set of crests, they're next to each other, it's a wave front and it's moving. What do you think is going to happen? It gets to the barrier, and now it gets to that point, what's going to happen? Any idea? Is there anything to stop it? No, is there going to be a bounce back? No, it's not going to Okay, you, know, you would think. Would you, you know, carry on. Eh? Carry on like that. And hit the side, you see it, bounce back. Okay, so what we need to recognize is the normal idea would be over here, it's going to carry on going forward. Over there, it's going to go and bounce back. And that's what we would think ha would happen. But, yes. Okay, very good question and very good term uh, so that we can, we can get that. We say that this is an example of this normal propagation. So let me write that down. We say it moves through a medium. We say the wave proper propagates or propagation. Um, there's a fancy term. We say rectilinear propagation, which means it's moving at right angles because it's a transverse wave to the direction of its motion. But propagation is good enough. Okay? But now, guys, the key part that we haven't looked at, the key area that we haven't looked at, uh, let me go over here, is what happens over here. Okay? At that corner. As it passes the corner, something very interesting happens. And guys, I need you to focus on this. I need you to understand this. Because this is critical to your understanding of that word, refraction. Remember, reflection, bounce back. Refraction means a bending when it changes medium. Now, we haven't got a change of medium. This is the same water. This is the same water. There's no change. The same depth, the same type of water. There's no reason for it to change. But what happens is, as it passes the medium, and we get into this situation now, there's suddenly nothing on the side. There's, it's like, can you imagine if you were squashed up against somebody, and you were walking in a corridor very tightly next to them, and now suddenly they fell away. They weren't there. You didn't have support pushing you in from the side. What's going to happen? You're going to do? You're going to bend over. You're going to fall that way. Okay? So that's exactly what happens here. And I, I'm going to put it into a different color and say it's going to be bending in that direction. So as this wave moves forward, you get spreading out and bending behind 
where the barrier was. So that curving behind the barrier, that's what we call diffraction. Well, I hope you got that. Make sure you understand it very clearly. As you've got the example, you can see that it's not going to just carry on going straight. This section, yes, this section will carry on going straight. But on the edge here, the edge from here is going to start spreading waves out. So the waves will begin to spread out behind the barrier. And if we go back up to the, the photograph, you will see that behind this barrier and, and around this barrier, waves can spread out. There's a pattern of waves behind the barrier. Um, and, and they change direction. They weren't going in the same direction as they were. They hit over here and they spread out behind here in a different direction. Okay, guys, you need to make sure that you've got this very clear. Uh, what I would challenge you to, to go and look, do is to get Google Maps either on your phone or on a computer, go and have a look at different beaches in South Africa. See if you can see the fraction patterns from those satellite pictures. Okay, now, brilliant. Remember I said to you that bending behind the barrier isn't the only example. But when we go through a gap, that's also an example. So, let's just erase the gap back uh, right from there with the word gap. Bigger and say to ourselves, what's going to happen if we know that waves bend when they pass through one side of the barrier, then we'd expect it to bend when there's two barriers. No, that wouldn't be difficult to predict. So, what we recognize here, and I just want to make this gap a little bit bigger, um, that's lost, so I want to allow it to move. I want to make the gap a little bit bigger and make this side a little bit bigger as well. And say, right, there we go. So now the wave is able to move, and what we're seeing is we've got the wave over here, and it's able to move straight through, and this one gets to there. But what we're going to find is because it moves through the gap, there's nothing on the side, it bends a little bit like that. And that carries on happening. It bends, and then there's a bit of a space. It bends, and it goes a bit of space. Bends. And so there's not much bending, okay? There is some bending behind the barrier, but not a whole lot. It, it hasn't really formed. It's still a straight bit. This bit is still straight. Just like that bit was straight. Just like that bit was straight before the line, okay? But there's been some bending over here. Not a big amount of diffraction happening. Now the interesting thing, guys, what happens if we make the gap smaller? And this is really quite exciting. And uh, it's really difficult to see if you do it on a, on a ripple tank. Uh, that's why I prefer to explain it on the board and draw some diagrams. But if we close the gap, then what you will find is the gap is very narrow. And it is smaller, and there almost doesn't seem a reason for this. But if it's smaller, than the wavelength. So remember, the distance between two wave fronts is the wavelength. If this gap, and I'm going to call the gap A, if A is less than the wavelength, or equal, but, but mostly less than, um, and maybe we need to make this a little bit, the barrier a little bit bigger. Uh, it's gone and locked itself again. Let's make it a bit bigger. So we can make the gap nice and small. Not that as small as I've indicated, but we make it even smaller. So now it's definitely smaller than the wavelength. I hope you can see that. We've got a small gap. Now what's going to happen? Watch and see. What's going to happen is instead of a straight bit and a bending bit, we get this whole thing being curved. And it will be like the pattern you get when you drop a pebble into a pond or into a circle. Okay? You get that concentric circle or circular wave developing and it spreads out in a circular form. These are still, please note, this is still a wave front. It's a wave front. These are still next, these are points that are still next to each other. They are crests. The 
quest for this truth. They're no longer disgraced, but they've now killed. And all because they were due to a little guy. Okay, uh, isn't that amazing? Uh, it is absolutely fascinating. And uh, you know what? It's got some amazing features. Not only because we will see that it has an implication for life, but it makes you sound interesting. Um, you might be annoyed because your brother is down the corridor and you're sitting in, the ro- in your room watching TV, but he's turning up his loudspeakers uh, on his stereo or on his, on his iPad. Pop. The reason you can hear is because the sound is passing through the gap in the door and it's spreading out, spreading out in a way just like this. So remember, it doesn't, sta- doesn't just happen to waterways, it happens to sound as well. The question scientists were asking when they discovered this process, this principle, they wanted to try and explain it, does it happen to life? And that's the big question, because if we've got evidence of life undergoing diffraction, being able to see that life bends around objects, which it doesn't normally, because we know that life normally travels straight and then casts a shadow behind the object. So what's this thing about life bending behind an object? How do we know it really happens? Well, if it, life doesn't bend around them, it's not a true way. So it was critical that scientists found out, does life undergo diffraction or doesn't it? And maybe that's a question you can think about. Um, because what we next we need to do next is we're going to introduce ourselves to that Dutch physicist, Huygens. Okay? Huygens, Huygens. I'm um, not exactly sure how to pronounce his name, but we'll call him Huygens. Uh, Huygens. And uh, we're going to understand his principle and use it to explain propagation of waves and diffraction of waves. So, Tony, um, let's get the learners onto the page. Let's get them asking any more questions that they've got about diffraction. Something isn't clear and they want another explanation. Let's give it to them. But I think we've come to the, the, the next ad break. Yes, we have come to the next ad break. As we are sitting at the feet of the pen, I will show the same water and just the next to the feet of the pen. We will show the next to the pen. I will show the next to the pen. Yeah, guys, this is the end of the library week competition, book competition. Now, we had more than 600 entries. Can you believe it? There were uh, an amazing response during the, the Easter school to the reading competition. And please go to that book list. There's some great books. I hope you've had a chance to read. Reading is wonderful. And at the moment, sponsored by Macmillan, we've got two books left. We've only got Clockwork Angel and we've got Monsters of Men. Now, which one is going to win? And who's going to get which one? Out of all those draws, we've already given eight other books away. Now, the question is, who's going to be the last two winners? Let us bring an end to our book week competition. So, Tommy, the names of the winners or the names of the people that are entered are in here. Uh, let's see who's going to be the lucky winner. Um, shall, shall we? I'll tell you what we'll do. In this one, we've got names of people. In this one, the names of the two books. So we know it's one of these two books. That's all that's left. Let's see who's going to be. Put your hand in. Don't look and mix it around. Pull out one. Okay, who we got? Open it up. Congratulations to Johannes from Mufaji Book Secondary School. Well done, that's great. Now, let's see. What, you, what are you rooting for, Johannes? Is it going to be Clockwork Angel or Monsters of Men? So we do the draw there. Okay, do, do the draw there. Which one have you got? 
Monsters of men. So, Johannes, you've got monsters of men coming to you. Uh, we'll get hold of you. Uh, we've got your phone number. We'll phone you and get your physical address and your uh, details so we can courier it to you. Okay, so that's that one. Which means that we've got one left. Who's it going to be? It's a clockwork angel. This is sponsored by Macmillan. And let's see who is going to be the winner. I uh, mix those entries up and let's see who we can get out of there. Okay, who have we got? We have got the Well done and congratulations. Uh, guys, there are going to be lots of competitions coming your way on Learn Extra, so don't miss out. Make sure you're watching every time. And uh, um, I hope you're enjoying the, the, the session as well. Um, let, let me get back to the board and. Uh, you carry on and uh, let the learners know what they need to know. Oh, yes, guys. Congratulations to our two winners right there. So, my said Learn Extra really loves spending all this time to see our people. So, remember, guys, you can also be a winner by entering our, uh, our competition that we have right now. It is called Jesus It's called Jesus Star. So, if you believe that you are a piece of Jesus Star, Please do like us on Facebook or rather go to our link where you can actually get to it later. We will be announcing our winners next month. Right now, though, let's get going into the coaching today. Great. Tommy, thank you so much. And uh, congratulations from me to all those winners as well. Uh, you all winners, get reading. It's a skill and a, an enjoyment that you will never regret. Uh, once you get hooked in books, uh, you will be surprised what you learn and how much says you up. Uh, you might not have a lot of money to travel, but when you open a book, you can go anywhere. So, take that challenge from me. Okay, now guys, Huygens Principle. Huygens Principle, uh, apart from the name, in many textbooks, the explanation of Huygens Principle. It's a long piece of writing that you need to learn. I don't want to do that. I want to just make it simple for you. So, I'm going to draw some pictures. The first step that you need to understand if Poison says, on a wave front, so now you'll understand why we were talking about wave front. On a wave front, represented by that blue line, every point on that wave front, he says, let's pretend that it acts as a little source to producing wavelets. So every one of these little points and I've only put three on, and he said, let's imagine that they are able to produce little wavelets that move out at the same velocity, the same wavelength and frequency into the medium. So, after a few seconds, or a certain amount of time, we would find that these wavelets have moved from this position where the source was, so they've moved from there, and they've moved out like that. And this one has moved out, and it's produced a wavelet. And it's moved from the source, that's the source, and this is the wavelet. Now, you can imagine, uh, we don't say wavelength, but we say wavelet. It's a little wave. Uh, so it's not a big wave, it's a little wavelet. Okay? Just a little one. So, just remember that, the difference between a wave and a little wave. And we're just drawing them as a semi-circular uh, little wavelet. Um, and we've illustrated that all of these now um, are in fact like little wave fronts themselves, miniature wave fronts. But what I want you to see is that they're going to interfere. And the more sources I have with each other, they're going to interfere with each other. Remember, there are two types of interference when we're talking about waves. We can get constructive interference, and that means that when two things combine uh, by the principle of superposition, they add together, and they reinforce each other, where you can get destructive, destructive interference, and that means they subtract from each other, so if we have subtract and they cancel out. 
so we have a crest and a cross meeting each other, we get something that is nothing. It cancels out at that point. Just at that moment, when the crest and the cross meet, they would cancel each other out. Where it was a crest, a little crest, and another crest, they would reinforce each other. So, we need to understand that to understand Hoyton's principle. What, what Hoyton said, if you multiply, and you put lots of these together, you would have an effect that is very interesting. And he said, if you've got these little wavelets, what you could actually do is you could predict where the next wave front would be. He said the wave front would occur, and my drawing isn't very good because I was just doing a freehand. The wave front would occur where the tangent to the curve, in other words, where the middle of the curve touches, there's a line drawn to the middle of all those wavelets. So this little source is producing that little bit over there of the wave. Just a little section going forward. I'm just going to shade it in. That little section. This little wavelet is producing that section. This little wavelet is producing that section. All the numerous infinite number of little sources in between here are going to produce little bits of the wave front going forward. They're going to sit next to each other and they're going to join together. You add them together to make the wave going forward. Okay? But now, what I need you to understand is what happens to this section, this curved section. Because at the moment, they have moved different, they've moved the same distance from there to there, um, but they're moving at different rates and different, they're moving at the same rate, they're moving at the same rate, they're moving through each other. And what Poison said is this path that is moving in a horizontal section, not moving forward, that's going to experience destructive interference. So the forward path is going to be constructive. The path that's moving sideways in a normal situation where you have a tank with two sides to it, um, or we're just looking at the middle section, it's going to carry on moving forward to form a straight wave front. Got that? Make sure that you've got it because it's going to be very important. Now, having said that about Poisson's principle, I want to summarize. Poisson's principle, first thing that you need to know, is every point on the wave front acts as a source. When we say it's a source, that means it produces little waves. So it's just like a little machine that vibrates and it produces. The source makes waves. The source makes waves. Second thing that he said, he said those waves will move the same frequency, the same wavelength, the same speed. So after a certain amount of time, they will be the same distance away from the previous wave front. All of them will be the same distance. The ones that have moved straight, they will form the tangent to the next wave front. The next wave front is the tangent to those circular bits. Lots of these circles will combine, we add them together. The in-between bits, we can cancel those out because they will interfere destructively. They won't be there. But their effect won't be there. But they're still present. Don't forget about them. They're going to be very important. Now, I, I want to move on because the next question leads on from Hoyton's principle. And here it's something for you to think about. What it says is use Hoyton's principle to explain how water waves bend around the barrier. Okay, there's a challenge for you. How do water waves bend around the barrier? And we need to use Poisson principle. Right? If you're missing these questions, I want to remind you, you can download them um, from our website at www.learnextra.co.za forward slash live. Go and look on the page, click the blue button and download it. There are some great questions coming up and I hope that you will, will follow those through. So, let's go to the barrier question. Remember, diffraction takes place when a wave bends around the barrier. Can Huygens principle help us explain it? Well, let's see. What we recognize is that that's a source. So that's a source, and there's another source over here, sitting over here, and there's another source that's sitting over here. And each of these sources 
is going to produce a wave function, uh, and so on and so on. So this one will produce a waveform, and it will look like this. The next wave will therefore be lying in this position over here, and just before the dome, just before the dome. Now, I hope you can see that what's going to happen is that we're going to get another little wavelet. And I'm going to move this wavelet to the other side of the barrier just so that I can explain it to you clearly. I want to unlock that and just move it, pretend for the moment. That part we know is going to get reflected, so we're blocking that out. And let's just put this on top. We'll make it bring to the front. We'll lock that out. And we're going to say to ourselves, what's going to happen to this part over here, which is the critical part? That little section there. What's going to happen to it? It's going to produce some more wavelets. These ones over here are going to radiate out like that. But what's this one going to do? I want you to see that this one is going to also start producing. Now, look what happens. Is there a neighbor on this side? Is there a neighbor on this side somewhere over there? that can cancel out this section. No, there isn't. So what you're going to see is there's going to be a straight section. Look at that. There's the straight section. And what have we got over here? We've got the curved section that bends into that section. There's nothing coming from this side to cancel out that section. So the end result, the end result is that you get curving behind the barrier. Uh, those wavelets on the corner that are generated by that source will continue to spread out like that. And that's what open principles is. And you can do exactly the same thing for a double, for a single strip. You can show that they will also spread out to make a bending pattern behind a, a barrier. Right. What about light? Now, guys, here's the critical section. Um, and it's not that easy. It took scientists a long time to work it out, and even now, there's not a very clear understanding of it. Uh, we would recognize that this is quite a mystery in some way, but we will try and unwrap the mystery. What we do know is that if you make the beam or the slit very small, there are a couple of conditions. Remember our first question to me? From, I can't remember who it was, but somebody on Facebook said, what are the conditions for diffraction? Now, remember what we said. We need a slit or we need a barrier. When you're talking about diffraction of light, we need to make sure of something. To really see diffraction, we need a very narrow slit. It must be a very narrow slit. Remember the wavelength of light, wavelength of light, about somewhere between 600 nanometers to about 800, that's visible light, to 800 nanometers. If you're watching earlier on the electromagnetic spectrum, note uh, for grade 10, you would have seen that, but it's in that region, a couple of hundred nanometers. So it's very small. We need the slit to be smaller, um, as small as possible, so that the light can get through, so we can get some diffraction. So very narrow slit. The second thing is also important. There's a confusion with light because white light, the light that we're seeing here in the studio, or the sunlight we see uh, if you're outside, um, light from a, um, even from a light bulb, even if it's a compact fluorescent light bulb, is many frequencies. And so we get strange effects happening with many frequencies. What we need to recognize to get the best type of evidence for the fraction of light is we need one frequency or one color. So we call it monochromatic chromatic light. This means that it's light of one frequency, one color. One color, chromo meaning color, mono one, and one color means one frequency. 
and God, the instrument that we use for one frequency of light, we don't have to study it, but it's a laser. Okay. So, in some of your textbooks, you will see that there are notes on lasers, um, but that's the condition to get single slit diffraction, uh, and you need one gap, monochromatic light, and then you'll see the best evidence. Okay. There is another general thing you can do, just to prove it to yourself. If you take your fingers and you pull them, push them close to, to each other, but just lift them slightly so there's a slight gap. And if you look at a distant light, so if you go down, if you're in a dark room, and you put a light on at the end of the passage, or you have a street light outside your window and it's really dark uh, inside, if you look through this section, what you will see is there's a fuzzy little gray, uh, almost shimmery black set of lines. You might think that something's gone wrong with your eye and there's a kind of a funny vibration on it. That's not the case. That is actually diffraction of light. Okay? Um, and it's different to what we said when we said it would spread out behind the barrier. Diffraction of light gives us a very special pattern. And that's what I'm saying to you. It makes it difficult to explain and difficult for you to understand. So here's the diagram. This actual question, this diagram here, uh, comes from a script paper, I think it was the 2010 paper, where you have monochromatic light, here's the barrier, here's a small slit, now they draw the slit width, and they say, if the slit width is A, that's gap, and slit width, slit, slit, ah, uh, got himself all wrong, so let's just do it again. The gap, slit, width. This could be on a dark slide, a smoked slide, a painted slide. The slice of a little, very sharp scalpel will give you a slit. That's more or less good enough. It's small enough. If you take a piece of glass and uh, you paint it with black, black paint, or you get smoke covered in, you do a little incision with a scalpel. That could be uh, narrowing up and then shining light through it. But it has to be laser light, monochromatic light. Even from a laser pointer, you'll get a special pattern, and hopefully you'll be able to see that. Now, the special pattern is often confusing. I want to show you what it looks like. And what I want you to see is that it's just like this. You get a bright region, and then you get dark regions. And then you get light regions that are not quite as bright. So there's the bright region, there's the dark region, there's the bright region, and it's not as bright and so it carries on. It carries it to the end. This is a special pattern called the diffraction pattern for light. We're going to do calculations next time on this particular phenomenon. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to diffraction. We'll carry it on next week, so don't miss out. Penny, great to be with you today. That's great. Lovely to have you too. Uh, I know it's been, been tough for you and it's, it's been the end of a long day, but uh, great. Wrap up our big time today. Thank you so much for watching the show today. And hope that you can see the same question from Central and Marshall. Thank you. Bye bye.